good afternoon, although kind of looks more like nighttime. Um, the Viking Age represents a period of increased connectivity, um, as Adrian was just telling us about, uh, including some significant population movements, making it an ideal case study for analyzing processes of migration and their aftermath. There is no doubt that mobility was a key feature of the Viking Age, as attested by both written accounts and the archaeology, including bioarchaeological analyses of human remains. During the late 8th to 11th centuries AD, Scandinavians traveled across various parts of the North Atlantic and also to other regions in the Mediterranean and Eastern Europe. In the North Atlantic, Scandinavians, coming mostly from present-day Norway and Denmark, settled in areas of northern France, Britain, and Ireland, and also in other territories further away, such as the Faroe Islands, Iceland, Greenland, and even Newfoundland in Canada. My recently completed PhD has focused on the Scandinavian settlement in parts of the Scottish Isles and Iceland, particularly focusing on the aftermath of migration, i.e how migrants and their descendants adapted to their new environments, but also maintained connections with their homelands. In my work, I have used concepts from cultural psychology, including Maslow's theory of human motivation, in which he laid out the hierarchy for human motivations, and this has been later developed and expanded by other authors. This psychology-based framework can be useful in attempting to understand the motivations behind migrations. The most basic level of the hierarchy is composed of physiological needs, so food, water, shelter. The next level consists of safety needs, including the preference for familiar rather than unfamiliar things, for the known rather than the unknown. The sense of belonging um, comes in with this and is really key. Familiarity with the landscape illustrates the often bound nature of emotions and the environment. An idea I've also put forward in our new British Academy volume, Selfless Plug, um, which I've co-edited with Manuel and two other editors, and is shown here on the slide. The concept of effectivating recognizes the emotional nature and actions involved in the process of interacting with the environment. Within this process, human beings make sense of their experiences by constructing meaning, with an aim to make known the unknown and familiar the unfamiliar. The construction of meaning centered here on the environment or landscape thus becomes a semiotic mediator for human behavior, thoughts, and feelings. If certain aspects of a landscape or environment are similar to those of where one is from, they can become a symbol of home, um, evoking a sense of belonging and familiarity and thus eliciting feelings of safety. There are several different elements, such as landscape, weather, the type of houses, um, raw material, and uh, even things such as sounds and smells that can create a sense of familiarity and belonging. And for this, I'd like to use a historic analogy, which harkens back to Peter's paper, um, that can illustrate how similar landscape features could often attract migrants so I've looked at documents on the earliest Swedish immigrants to Minnesota. This region received the highest number of Scandinavian immigrants in the entire USA. Among the most interesting sources is F. Brimmer's um, letters that she composed into a book in 1853. Uh, the following on familiarity of the landscape of Minnesota for the northern immigrants really illustrates this point. What a glorious new Scandinavia might not Minnesota become. Here would the Swede find again his clear romantic lakes, the plains of Scania rich in corn, and the valleys of Norland. Here would the Norwegian find his rapid rivers, his lofty mountains, for I include the Rocky Mountains in Oregon in the New Kingdom, and both nations their hunting fields and their fisheries. The Danes might here pasture their flocks and herds and lay out their farms on richer and less misty coasts than those of Denmark. In addition to this landscape, which might have originally drawn the first Swedish immigrants, the formations of Swedish communities would have brought a sense of cultural familiarity outside of the homeland, leading to a sense of belonging. Moving back to the Viking Age, 
kind of. Um, the Western diasporic settlements were frequently located in mountainous landscapes, primarily derived from the same geological formation event, the Caledonian orogeny. The current remnants of the Caledonides stretch from Norway to the Appalachian Mountains in the U.S., with areas of Greenland, Ireland, and Scotland in between having remains of this formation. Iceland, on the other hand, began forming around 60 million years ago as the Mid-Atlantic Ridge began pulling apart, creating a mountainous and highly active volcanic island. After the glaciers began to melt at the end of the last ice age, vegetation slowly began to take hold of all three lands, although at varying rates. <clears throat> By the Viking Age, Norway was around 60% forested, Iceland 30%, and the Scottish Isles had primarily been deforested. So while at first glance several aspects of the landscapes might have been familiar, others would have differed quite significantly. For instance, many resources that were readily available in the homeland um, were not present in the newly settled areas. In Norway, the longhouse came into use beginning in the Bronze Age and continued through the early medieval period. Shifts from two-aisled to three-aisled structures in the Iron Age with fewer posts created a more flexible interior space. And in general, um, burials were furnished and used the past or the landscape to display relational identities. Immediately preceding the arrival of the Vikings in the territory of modern day Scotland um, were several different groups, but I focused on the Scottish Isles in particular, and this was primarily occupied by the Picts. By the time of the first Scandinavian settlements in the Isles, the Picts had been Christianized for centuries, which had a significant impact on their burial practices and their material culture, um, leaving most graves unfurnished and Christian symbols appearing in their art. Architecturally, Pictish settlements tended to be constructed using stone, with a preference at least in the Isles for rounded buildings. Iceland, on the other hand, has no archaeological evidence of previous inhabitants, so Scandinavians were settling in a previously empty landscape. Um, whether through the use of personal ornamentation, the production of textiles, or the shaping of domestic spaces, aspects of identity can be seen through the material culture that people create and are created by, conditioning the way in which reality is experienced on a daily basis. Settlements are one of the key types um, for analyzing the daily life of individuals in the past. The sites of Bornish located in South Uist, as well as Westness and the Brochberse in Orkney represent um, part of the Scottish case studies for which I collected data. While the Icelandic case studies were Hofstadter and Mivottenswijt in nor the northeast and Reykjavik, Kvitarholt, and Thjorsodaler in the southwest. In both sets of case studies, the primary residential structures of Scandinavian settlements in the North Atlantic were very similar um, at the most basic level, i.e. their shape. Um, However, the Scottish Isles and Iceland show significant structural and material changes from the longhouses found in Norway, reflecting adaptation to the local environment and available building materials. For example, at Bornish, the longhouses were semi-subterranean, uh, similar to the late Iron Age houses that immediately preceded the Viking Age ones. In addition, while Norway saw the transition to more open interior domestic spaces, and the externalization of craft activity to outbuildings or further afield to central places, Scotland and Iceland maintained the three-aisled longhouses with craft activities primarily remaining within the house. Icelandic sites saw the addition of annexes to the longhouses, um, extending the domestic space, which allowed for further storage and craft production within the house. In terms of burial traditions, two main characteristics of the Viking Age Scandinavian graves were the inclusion of grave goods and the importance of place, as can be seen in Norway at sites um, such as Avaldsnes in the southwest or Ege in Trøndelag. In general, Norwegian Viking Age burials were kept outside of the boundary of the home field. 
In Scotland, a shift is seen with adaptations to the local culture's practices, with Bornish having no graves in keeping with the Iron Age tradition in the area, and Orkney having burials within the home field, as seen at the Broch Birse. The establishment of links with the past is also observable, with burials of Scandinavians in older cemeteries and monumental structures such as the Broch of Gurness. The grave goods marked the deceased as Scandinavian with boat burials and the inclusion of grave goods such as oval brooches, neftoffel gaming sets, and weapons of Scandinavian type. In Iceland, in general, the burials can be grouped in two ways, those that are situated immediately outside of the home field and those further away from settlements, typically near boundaries between farms. In both cases, burials were used as a way of establishing place identity and at the same time to draw divisions between the family and the wider community. Another marked feature of the Viking Age North Atlantic settlements is the importation and extensive reuse of items from Norway, most especially Norwegian schist, um, such as Eidsborg schist, and steatite or soapstone. These items were incredibly common in Scotland and Iceland, despite the distance from the actual raw material sources. Many items from these um, materials show extensive reuse and or reworking, illustrating attempts to really lengthen the lifespan of the object and material more generally, um, with soapstone sherds frequently being reworked into spindle whorls or other items. The environment, both social and physical, of the diasporic areas significantly impacted the lives of Scandinavian immigrants from the architecture of their settlements to the places they chose to bury their dead. While many of the modifications made to settlements may at first glance appear to be solely due to ecological and climatic differences between regions, they were also impacted by social differences between the homeland and the areas of settlement. Broadly speaking, the availability of resources determined the materials used in constructing settlements. In Scotland, the materials Stone and turf continued to be the same as those used in the preceding periods, while in Iceland they were largely determined by accessibility. In the settler context of the Viking Age Scottish Isles, people of different origins were living in close proximity to each other, undoubtedly leading to interactions and encounters. In Scotland, we can observe a hybridization of identities and an attempt to establish a connection with the new land. This is exemplified, among others, by the reuse of older settlement mounds and the modification of three of Scandinavian-style three-aisled houses. Burial practices also illustrate this trend, with very few Viking Age graves um, known from the Hebrides, or the Outer Hebrides, where the local tradition of invisibly disposing of the dead continued. On the other hand, in Orkney, burials were placed in both ancient settlements and pre-existing cemeteries, signaling a carryover of reuse from the homeland, while at the same time adapting to the local custom of burying closer to settlements. The early Icelanders, in interacting with the local environment and each other, formed a cultural identity distinct from, while at the same time, very much connected to the homeland. The importance and centrality of the house within Icelandic society can be seen through the development of annexes, which were attached to the walls of the longhouse. Unlike other areas of the Viking diaspora, the past could not be used to tie Icelanders to their land or community. Instead, new ways of connecting with the land and forming community were needed. The relatively even distribution of graves across farms of varying prosperity points to the use of burials in connecting families to their land, creating place identities and accentuating familial bonds. The North Atlantic settlements of the Viking diaspora reflect the maintenance of connections with the homeland archaeologically. This is best illustrated in the importation of certain goods, such as Norwegian schist west stones and soapstone objects. Other everyday objects also connected Scandinavians, showing their cultural affiliations, including textile equipment and combs. Through these materials, connections with the homeland were manifested within everyday life, bringing the familiar to an unfamiliar world. In creating their local identities and establishing themselves 
within their new social and physical environments, differing strategies were used depending on the situation into which they entered. In the Scottish Isles, where other groups were already present, the settlers created hybridized identities, blending Scandinavian elements with local ones. In Iceland, where the settlers encountered an empty landscape, the Scandinavian cultural traits remained more prominent, although society developed in a less centralized way than the trends observable in the homeland. Thank you.